My name is Sam Mazahiri. Is it working? Can you hear me? Hi, everybody. My name is Sam Mazahiri. It is a great pleasure and honor uh, as a representative of uh, Pyong ANZ uh, Northern Chapter Leadership Committee to welcome you to this exciting seminar, Planning for Automation, Planning for Automation of Container Terminal at Engineer Australia Auditorium in Brisbane. I would like to thank all who showed their interest in participating in this thrilling uh, topic uh, and either presented here or uh, logged in through our webinar system to watch the presentation and listen to our speakers. Michael Cowell and Andrew uh, Cato, uh, who will be chairing this event shortly, uh, will give you more information regarding the event and also the speakers. But before that, I would like to take this opportunity to uh, say a few words about uh, Pyong ANZ and the Northern Chapter. Pyong ANZ, a Northern Chapter, is one of the Pyong's regional chapters responsible for sharing industry knowledge and best practice in respect to waterborne infrastructure in Queensland and Northern Territory. Uh, holding events, contributing to high quality technical uh, reports and standards, organizing technical site visits and supporting the next generation uh, professional in industry uh, are some of the chapter's activity, just to name a few. If you are interested to become a member, get access to more than 100 uh, high quality articles and uh, guidelines, practical guidelines, or participate in our technical uh, uh, groups, uh, please visit our website at www.pionk.org.au or send an email to one of our members or one of the admin staff to get more information and support. Uh, now is the time to hand over the floor to Michael and, you know, also Andrew. Thank you very much. Enjoy the the, the, the session. Thank you, Sam. Um, so, as Sam said, welcome to this presentation on planning for automation of container terminals that is be arranged by Pianc ANZ Northern Chapter. Uh, my role is uh, is as a co-chair with Andrew Cato um, to help. Uh, the smooth running of the presentations. So my role will be to introduce the speakers um, and get things rolling, and Andrew will moderate the questions and close out the evening at the end of the presentations. So as background, over the period between 2019 and 2021, the Pianc Working Group 208 prepared a report on planning for automation of container terminals, and this report was published earlier this year. I'm really pleased to be able to tell you we've got four uh, very well qualified speakers joining us uh, this evening, all of, made, all of which have made a major contribution to the report. Uh, due to sort of COVID and also, um, uh, I guess, time restrictions, uh, only one of the speakers is present with us here in the auditorium in Brisbane, that's Michael Howan. Uh, the other three speakers, uh, well, two of the speakers will be joining through the webinar, and the other speaker. Um, we've got a pre-recorded uh, address from him. So a little, little bit about the speakers before we get started. Tom Ward is the Director of Maritime Planning at WSP US. Tom has over 35 years of experience in multimodal freight planning and operations analysis for major maritime and intermodal logistics transportation projects, including conventional, semi-automated and fully automated container terminals. In addition to container terminal projects, Tom has led the planning design and or development of brake bulk, dry bulk, project cargo, row row and auto terminals. Prior to joining WSP, Tom led facility planning and engineering efforts at Ports America for seven years, providing him with a unique insight into the intersection of engineering and operations across a broad range of marine terminal types. Tom was the chapter lead for chapter two of the report and in his presentation, which has been pre-recorded, Tom will introduce the, the Working Group 208 report and we'll talk to chapters one to three. Uh, as I said, Tom is based in Oakland, California, so it's due to the time differences, I think it's about 3 a.m. in the morning there at the moment, and he's elected to, uh, to pre-record the, the material. Our second speaker, Tom Crawford-Condy, is a Principal Maritime Engineer at WSP Australia. 
and Tom has spent many years working on the planning and design of container terminals in Australia and around the world, which from 2016 to 2020, including being the design manager for the design of a new fully, fully automated container port in Q8. Tom's experience on that project led to his appointment to the Working Group 208 Committee as the Young Professional Representative for Pianc Australia. Tom is currently working on a number of projects for the Port of Melbourne, including working closely with Tom Ward to develop container capacity models to assist with their future extension plans. Tom has made a significant contribution to Chapter 6. and He'll be talking to Chapters 4 and 5 tonight. Carsten Varming is our third speaker, and Carsten is the Port Development Manager at NSW Ports. Carsten was the Chapter Lead for Chapter 6 of the document, and Carsten has extensive experience in both design and development of maritime infrastructure, having worked across the world in a variety of roles on both small to large port infrastructure projects. He has a particular interest in automation of container terminals and is project managing delivery of two fully automated on-dock rail terminals for NSW ports, delivering Australia's first fully automated container handling rail terminal. Stage one of the first rail terminal is fully operational and stage two is under construction with the second terminal in conceptual development stage. In previous roles, he has delivered projects for both greenfield and brownfield container terminal developments, ranging from manual container terminals through to semi-automated container terminals. Our fourth speaker, Michael Howen, is the director of Smart Port Strategy at Hatch. Michael joined the Hatch Ports team last year after nearly 20 years of experience in automated container terminal operations. Previously, as National Automation Manager for Patrick Terminals, Michael was responsible for two of the world's foremost automated terminals in Brisbane and Sydney. And he has also been involved in consulting, collaborating with other automated terminal operators globally. Michael has proven skills in systems design, organisational change, project management, functional safety and automated equipment systems. His expertise provides unique insight into the technical and organisational challenges of building and operating automated facilities and the need to craft solutions that deliver the key objectives of adapting to thrive in a rapidly changing industry that has been driven forward by the digital revolution. Michael contributed to Chapter 6 of the document. Um, both Carson and Michael will both talk to Chapter 6 and wrap up the presentation. Um, I don't know if that's um, got you salivating, but there's some really good uh, experience in all the four of our speakers there, and I'm excited to, to hear what they've got to say. Um, so without further ado, we'll get started. Um, the first presentation is from Tom Ward, as I mentioned, and if things go really well, it will work and you'll be able to hear it as well. Good day. I'm Tom Ward, Director of Maritime Planning for WSP USA, and a member of Beyond's Maritime Commission Working Group 208 focused on the planning of automated container terminals, which completed its work earlier this year and published its final report. We're here to present a brief overview of that report. There's a lot of detail in it, so we're going to kind of give you a guided tour and leave you to download the, the document and read it if it's appropriate to your work. Our goal was to provide some guidance owners, operators, and designers of container terminals worldwide so they can understand what they're getting into as they're getting into an automated terminal. Um, this is far as we know the first focused effort to establish such a standard or uh, guidance. We have seven chapters in the document, starting with just general aspects and ending up with some very important conclusions for the reader. Sections one, two, three, uh, all cover in brief today. Um, focusing on general aspects, the, the nature of the terminals, um, and the business case for automation. And then I'll turn it over to my comrades over there, finish up with planning, integration, engineering, and conclusions. There are some very nice appendices in the document as well that provide some brief information around the world. This is a large uh, committee from, with people from all over the world, in, as we found a great many time zones as we were doing our meetings led by Ashford Jacob of Moffat Nico in the United States, supported by Juan Marco Manuel Suarez of Port Echo in Spain. My role was in charge, being in charge of Chapter 2, uh, which focused on uh, the, the nature of existing terminals and the definition of terms. We had 
have a lot of corresponding members from around the industry. Manufacturers and software people operating terminals, people who developed terminals like this, um, equipment societies, and so forth. Uh, these uh, checked our work as it was being developed and uh, provided valuable input all through the process. Our thanks go out to everyone who's involved and volunteered during an extremely valuable time in doing this. So chapter one um, covers the general structure of the, the report and its relationship to other reports that have been produced by PIAC, which is a, a growing number. Uh, it's a growing and important library of um, planning and design documents on the maritime side. As background framework for, for the report, we recognize that ports are handling by tonnage about 90% of global trade and they're under steady pressure to increase their capacity and their efficiency and their, to reduce their impact on the environment. While they're constantly responding to an evolving maritime environment, including new and bigger ships, consolidation of carriers, and so forth. Container trade is an absolutely crucial uh, element of our global prosperity and peace, uh, but it's very complex and it is very lucrative. There's a lot of money involved. Uh, with lots of different stakeholders. Competition is very high, and the infrastructure that we're developing, especially automated terminals, is very capital intensive. So it has to be done right. So port development has to consider a great many things in deciding whether to proceed and how to proceed with automation. The automation process is complex and needs to be properly structured. This is a good general structure for it presented in chapter, uh, chapter one. It also provides an outline for the document. Chat section of the, the process begins with developing the business case. Why are you planning this terminal? Section four uh, focuses on what the terminal should look like. This is where we begin uh, introduction to inter integration in section five. Integration uh, is, the, is making sure all the pieces and parts of the terminal work together. And it spans, starts with planning, but it continues right through engineering implementation. And operation. So integration is a, a step in the development part. Uh, section six is, it deals with engineering and implementation and the move to go live, the first commercial commercial moves of the facility, but then beyond that, in making sure that the facility matches the business case. This is a long process. This could take five, six, seven years from first uh, desire to uh, completed project. And it can have many twists and turns along the way. Section two of the document focuses on the history a little bit of uh, automation and semi-automation of marine terminals. It defines concepts and, and terminology that's used in the rest of the document. Key to understanding automation is common terminology. At, at a fundamental level, automation is um, application of the technology that allows the machine to work without human assistance. Semi-automation at the machine level allows that machine to work with intermittent human assistance, sometimes. These are different from remote control, in which a human operator is controlling the machine either fully or intermittently from a remote control from a remote station not on the machine. At the terminal level, a fully, a semi-automated terminal automates the storage and retrieval of containers in the storage yard. A fully automated terminal adds to it the transport of those containers from one place to another within the terminal. For us, a crane was any machine that raises, shifts, or lowers containers. A transporter was a machine that moves containers from place to place. There's a particular class of container with a little bit of called straddle carrier that does both. So we talked about automation of the crane, automation of transports, and automation of the interface between cranes and transport units. Some of those transporters may be manual, some of those transporters may be automated. A key discussion uh, when you're considering building a new, uh, building an automated terminal is the, the nature of the property that you have available. Many or most of the world's existing automated terminals have been new builds, largely or entirely on existing land that's not currently used for port operation. And 
that's because if you're going to do a replacement of an existing cord, you're going to reduce its capacity for a period of time. And the revenue associated with that cap of capacity drop has to be banked, has to be financed. So it raises the capital cost of the grid associated with the trouble. And when you add it to all the other risks associated with the problem, the trouble has, in most cases, become an overwhelming barrier. So there have only been a few replacements, and they are typically not impossible, but they take a little bit more focus. Key automated elements of the, the, on the physical side, key cranes, obviously, for loading and unloading ships. Yard cranes for storing and retrieving containers. We've shown a variety of automated, set of auto pair, uh, automated stacking crane runs as you bring along cranes. Transporters, uh, we show a variety of different straddle carriers, the string trucks that uh, move containers in and out of the terminal, as well as something called a shuttle carrier. This is like a short straddle carrier. And then there's the interfaces themselves between all of these pieces of equipment. There's a lot of technology uh, that goes into these systems and that are described in the report and defined for you. Uh, a lot of positioning, different technologies. You need to know where the robots are at all times and their relationship to one another. And a wide variety of technologies and systems are used for that purpose. On the machines themselves, we're used to machines having a lot of uh, instruments and so forth on them. Automated machines have even more. A lot of telemetry, limit switches, encoders, and so forth. We're used to thinking of container handling equipment as machines with instruments on them. In an automated terminal, I think of them as instruments with machines underneath them. The, the, the focus of the machine has to it moves away from so much its motors and drives and, and steel and much more on its electronics and data collection and data transmission capabilities. When we, we talk about uh, at the, the wider uh, the issues with the terminal, there is some uh, uh, more data systems, obviously, that, that have to go into it. You have to have automated inventory management and so forth. The equipment condition needs to be monitored. There has to be a major data center on the terminal that has to be very secure and safe and redundant. There's a lot of data transmission going on here. So think of fiber optic. Maybe 5G, but for, that, for right now, a lot of stuff's being done fiber optic and Wi-Fi. Um, on the infrastructure side, a lot of the terminal is affected by your decision to automate, starting with an off and off apron, going all the way back into the buildings. All of those are impacted by automation. And of course, there's terminal operation control so equipment control systems. The little diagram on the bottom shows kind of the relationship between all of the stakeholders uh, on the left. Uh, and on the right, uh, all the resources of the facility between them, there's a terminal operating system and an equipment control system uh, that provide the interfaces uh, through that problem, through that connectivity. The report covers the proven concepts so far. I think we described 13 of them, uh, different combinations of uh, cranes and transporters, uh, varying levels of automation. Um, and uh, we tried to focus on proven concepts uh, and touch briefly on some of the ones that are, very briefly on the ones that are mm, not quite proven and over the horizon. And that brings up an important point. This report may be updated from time to time because the state of the art is continuing to well, And so we may need to update the report and Pion has, has expressed support for including the, this is one of their reports that may get some identity. Once we have this terminology established in section two, we move to the business case. The business case is your justification, continuing justification for continuing with, uh, with the completion of the project. And it's a complex web of information development early on in the project. There's traditional stuff, market and demand, you know, the volumes, whose services are you serving, what sort of revenues are associated with those, what sort of tariffs involved. Great. But early on, you're going to have to make some decisions about technology and performance, its productivity, its utilization, how many machines are going to be required, how that affects the civil works and the IT. And those decisions are going to start to affect your understanding of operating cost and capital cost. And along with revenue and tariffs are going to flow into a financial model that's going to be the money. It's going to justify whether this facility, could, this operation could be banked, both on the private side and on the public side. 
also, the business case also has to reflect non-monetary things, the environment, and what mitigations are going to be required as you develop this facility. Social impacts on labor, the skill set for your, for your workforce, and safety, uh, both to your workforce and to the people who come to visit the terminal to do the business. And all of these have uncertainty, and all of them carry risk, and all of them generate contingency that goes into the business. So chapter three walks through each piece of these. Market demand is, is fairly traditional. The only caveat is that you're putting a lot of money on the line and you have to be really, really confident there's going to be enough volume to pay for the capitalization. So um, your market demand has to be very, very robust. You have to have very, very high confidence, which is why a lot of terminals have been developed by terminal operators with a, a strong shipping line partner who can guarantee volume. Technology and performance, capacity and productivity. The terminal of the report talks a great deal about the interactiveness between the terminal's capacity, how many containers it can do in a year, and its productivity, how many containers it can do in an hour. In an automated terminal, those are much more intertwined than they are in manual terminals. So the terminal has to be balanced, it has to be flexible, and it has to be efficient. Capital and operating costs, we kind of figure all those things out. But there are some unusual things. Obviously, your labor is going to be reduced because you're automating. But there's going to be less unproductive time. You're going to be able to use the terminal um, in hours when you normally wouldn't use it. Maintenance recall, the repair costs are going to be down because the machines are, are automated and, and less prone to damage. Um, there's going to be less equipment operator training, but potentially more staff training costs. Uh, so those have to be taken into account. All those go into the financial model. And the financial model is going to be a dynamic object. You, at the beginning of this process, you know very little. And as you know more and more and more, the contingency, the uncertainty decreases and the, the uh, contingency declines. So the financial model is something we keep coming back to. Automated terminals have a very different impact on the environment, particularly with regard to energy and emissions, because most of the equipment on the terminal now begins to be electrified rather than diesel driven. Uh, all of those that all that needs to be taken into account needs to be taken to be quantified and presented. The terminals also make less noise, um, and they also provide uh, generate less lighting because the robots can see in the dark. So all of these environmental factors need to be presented in the business case and they need to be quantified. The social impact of automation is very obviously very front and center. Uh, we're we're displacing the workers who operate the machine. But they're not the only people impacted. There's a lot of impact on the people who manage the terminal who have been used to managing things very, very uh, hands on. But now that you've been used to an equipment control system and a terminal operating system that leaves them at very neat bunch of, uh, a distance from the machines themselves. So there's it's going to be a different uh, work environment for everybody involved. And you have to be able to, in your business case, you have to determine. Can your workforce do it? Can your workforce do it? Does the local community have the workforce that can support you? If you build this thing, who's going to fix it? Who's going to program it? Who's going to keep the software running? Um, so you have to assess whether those things are risks or, or, or not. And of course, safety. Uh, so far, uh, knock on wood, nobody's been killed or maimed by an automated system. And it's actually essential for us to do it this way. Keep, keep this up. We don't, we don't want to kill anyone. I used to be with a terminal operating company. I was very sensitive to that, that getting, getting our people killed. Um, we have to recognize that humans are not always at their best. So we always have to recognize that they won't always follow some standard operating procedures. And if they don't follow standard operating procedures, we don't want the automated terminal to kill them just because they made a mistake. So all this needs to be dealt with. It's dealt with in the safety section of the document. And then risk. Lots of sources of risk, institutions, the infrastructure, and so forth, innovation. In the end, it ain't what you don't know that's going to get you into trouble. It's what you know for sure. It just ain't so. We can see Mark Twain here in the United States. It's especially true in the automated world. The business case has a lot of key performance indicators. One on the left are more 
external facing the public or the, uh, institutions outside the terminal, which is public acceptance, tariffs, goods being liquidated, and so forth. And on the right are more your internal ones, your costs, your standardization, how the automated terminal fits with the rest of your, your organization's business model locally and worldwide, can you control it, and so forth. So those are the first three sections of the document. Section four is planning. With that, I will turn it over to my compadres over there in Australia. Thank you for your time today. Uh, you're recording this simply because I'm on the far side of the planet, and right now it's about one in the morning. So, good day. Thank you. Tom, we're on, on to you now, Tom. Uh, yes, so um, good evening, everyone. I understand, um, Michael, you're going to drive the slides for me? Correct. Yeah. Uh, so um, yes, good evening, everyone. Um, as uh, Michael said earlier, my role on the PIANC working group uh, was uh, as a contributor mainly to chapter six. Um, however, we've got a few of us this evening covering who covered chapter six. so. I've taken on the role of talking to chapters four about planning and chapters five about integration. Uh, so I just warn you that these were not, I wasn't the, the main author for these sections. So um, please forgive me if uh, you want to ask questions later. I don't know the definitive answer, but I'll um, run through each section, give you a brief overview of uh, what these sections contain. Would love to delve into a lot more depth, but uh, there's a lot to cover and there's not too much time. So uh, moving on to the next slide, please. Well, sorry. <laughs> so um, check, chapter four begins with sort of an introductory chapter that just describes um, the terminal planning process, um, identifying initially some key uh, principles for uh, planning of container terminals in general, um, capacity, productivity, balance, and flexibility are all at the heart of planning any container terminal. Um, however, they are not necessarily complementary, and they are different for an automated terminal than they are for a manual terminal. So it's important to determine the right uh, mix of these um, when deciding how to go ahead with automation. And phasing is another um, key aspect that uh, it depends on the individual scenario of a particular terminal, but again has um, bigger implications in an automated terminal where adding extra phases in the future adds extra complications to trying to scale up um, the equipment. Moving on to the next slide. The Document then also uh, just gives a bit of an overview of the of the planning process, which um, is covered a bit more in the next few slides. But it also introduces the concept of a core team, and one of the key factors that the working group decided um, is important when planning to automate a contained terminal is that the core team, much more so than with a manual terminal, needs to involve all um, disciplines within an organisation from as early as possible in the process. Uh, there's um, you know, it needs to have the operational buy-in, equipment specialists, um, the uh, specialists for the IT systems and so on, um, as well as a, the traditional engineering, the equipment procurement, it all goes hand in hand. It isn't a, a things that can be done in isolation. Uh, and also specialists related to labor relationships, potentially given the uh, sensitivity of um, automation in regards to labor relations. Section 4.2 is just a brief overview of opportunities and constraints, um, which are generally um, you know, around the geographical location and, and surrounding area of a terminal, um, similar for manual and an automated terminal. But in a particular scenario, an automated terminal might be more impacted by some of those opportunities and constraints, and that needs to be carefully considered. The next slide. Um, chapter 4.3 introduces uh, and goes into quite a bit of detail around business process modeling. Um, this is recommended for all new terminals, manual or automated, uh, and there's various specialist tools available to, to help. Um, but you know, many manual, existing manual terminals, there may not be business process models in place where the terminal is mature and the business process is well understood. Um, but it is really critical if you're planning to convert those manual terminals to automated. This is where business processing modeling is really vital um, because 
not only do you need you need to understand how you're operating now, you need to understand how you're going to be operating after the automation, but you also need to understand how you're going to operate during that transition, where you may have two very different business mo models happening uh, in parallel. Uh, and level, it's three general levels of business process modeling. Level one being the highest level, which is helping something which is done during the business case to help define what your scope of automation is. Level two is the planning stage to help identify uh, the resource and functionality needed to for the terminal development. Now, level three is something that often in a manual terminal might only be done just before starting operations. But again, for an automated terminal, this becomes much more critical because this is uh, identifying how the individual elements of the infrastructure, the equipment and systems are all going to work together. Um, and so it's recommended this be done, brought forward and be carried out as part of the engineering phase so that there is no uh, no gaps. Okay, moving on to chapter 4.4, which introduces the um, the options you have for automation. As Tom introduced, um, you have been semi-automated or fully automated. Uh, there are different elements of the whole system, and it's a decision to be made on the degree of automation um, to be adopted. And this uh, figure just illustrates how different part, different components of the terminal being automated changes your overall level of automation for the whole terminal. Uh, chapter 4.4 also discusses some of the particular options for converting from manual. Um, you know, it can be a staged approach. It doesn't necessarily need to be go all into fully automated. There could be um, different stages to go through um, to, to get there gradually. So, uh, as part of, so next slide please, as part of um, considering the operation modes, there's a lot of detail in the report around how the choice of equipment impacts that. It's obviously very closely uh, tied together, the, uh, the type of equipment that's going to be used and how the terminal would be automated. So this provides a lot of guidance around the key cranes, um, the options around key cranes, yard cranes, the transporters, um, various elements to consider in that process, um, as well as what is your overall manufacturer choices and procurement strategy, um, because the choice of manufacturers may dictate to some extent uh, the equipment that's available and therefore how you're going to automate. And it's also the operating systems need to be considered at the same time. Okay, next slide. Uh, so then there's about four sections of the document that really, although they're in order, because there has to be an order, they all go hand in hand and need to be read together. Um, section 4.5 uh, talks about the initial sizing of the terminal um, and 4.6 is the uh, decisions around uh, how you're going to configure the terminal. Uh, the methods of assessing capacity for the berth and the yard are basically similar to as it would be for a manual, between a manual terminal and an automated terminal, they're fairly similar. Uh, and there are other PIANC working group guidelines available that provide further advice on those general um, principles. Um, but this, as Tom mentioned in his introduction, the link between capac capacity and productivity uh, of equipment is much greater in an automated terminal than it maybe is in a manual terminal. So there's some additional guidance specific to those issues. And the aim is to basically develop initial plans with the different options. Um, there's guidance provided in the document regarding the detailed configuration of the wharf, uh, the stacks, the circulation areas for um, transporters and uh, landside transport. Um, there's also some notes in there regarding reefer and empty containers, which are things which maybe in the early planning of a manual terminal don't get as much attention, but they're things, particularly reefers, that are uh, very significant because of the ongoing manual role that at this stage can't be uh, automated out and how those manual operations are um, integrated with the automated operations. So as although the key focus is on things like the berth and the, the, um, the yard, the document also provides guidance around um, other elements of an automated terminal that do need to be considered when developing your initial uh, configurations, things like the buildings and other support facilities. Um, the positions of those become really critical. How you, do you get to and from them? How does the automated equipment get to and from the maintenance workshop, for example? How do you do battery changes or recharging or refueling of the equipment and so on? Um, exception handling, again, it becomes more complex um, where these things are not non-standard and the automated systems can't automatically know how to deal with them. 
Uh, and there's also guidance around the interface with landside transport, so that's be at the road gates or intermodal rail yards. Uh, there's particularly extensive guidance around the, the rail yards and, and how they can be automated. Okay, uh, then section 4.7 is then building on that initial configuration and, and choices around the equipment in terms of how to size the fleet of equipment. Uh, there's extensive guidance on this, recognizing that it's a very complex subject. Um, there are significant differences between in the behavior between automated equipment and manual operated equipment, pros and cons of each scenario, um, which needs to be uh, carefully considered. Uh, and it also needs to be um, you know, a, 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 a focus on, as Tom said, all of these the, Man, the automated terminal operates as a full system um, with interfaces between each of the components and achieving your overall productivity goals for the whole terminal uh, depends on getting having enough productivity at each of those interfaces, which requires adequate equipment fleets. And it's not with an automated terminal, it's not as easy as it might be for manual problem to just throw more machines at a problem. You know, if it's if the terminal isn't getting the, the capacity you were hoping for, just sticking more cranes in isn't going to solve that problem if there's something more deep rooted in how the automated system has been set up. Uh, there's a section 4.8 regarding uh, static and dynamic fleet uh, equipment fleet analysis. Um, initially, during the earlier stages of planning, typical uh, static simulation um, using spreadsheets or empirical comparisons with other terminals is usually sufficient to, to develop the initial um, ideas. But once you get down to a small number of for configurations, it's strongly recommended to consider some form of, of dynamic analysis to be able to test uh, the really complex variability within a terminal. And it's not the intention of this document to go into detail around how dynamic simulation is or should be done. Um, there's, you know, it's a very specialist field. There's a lot of specialist expertise out there who can provide that uh, support. But what the document does do in Appendix D is provide some background information just to to uh, inform the, the, the planner of uh, what options there are and how dynamic simulation works and, and what it what its strengths and weaknesses are um, as uh, some additional guidance and that's captured in Appendix D of the document. So chapter 4.9 uh, then just is again linked to that original initial configuration but it's about what is the actual layout of the terminal and the key focus here is perpendicular container stacks versus parallel container stacks. Again similar decisions as for a manual terminal but with an automated terminal, uh, the decision has a bigger impact on how the whole thing is going to function, and it's locked in. You know, it's harder to change that later in the process, either later in the design or even once it's operating, if you decide the original decision wasn't correct. And there are significant issues to be resolved around how you uh, have the land side and water side interfaces, uh, particularly with a parallel terminal. Uh, so chapter 10 is on the next slide is a bit of an overview of planning issues across all the different elements that goes into some quite specific details of some of the challenges that need to be addressed particularly with each component whether it's the stacking cranes the transporters um, uh, different types of um, of crane uh, it also has a particular focus on automated rtgs which is you know, there's a not so much in Australia, but around the world, there are a lot of manual RTG terminals, and it's a real focus for the industry to try and uh, come up with a solution for converting those to automated, because that's you know is it, a is a um, uh, a major uh, cost benefit compared to trying to uh, reconstruct a manual terminal into an automated terminal. Um, but there are very specific uh, uh, big challenges to resolve regarding that, particularly around the, um, the separation of manual and automated transport. And some of those challenges are explained in the document. Uh, chapter 4.11 then, once you've identified the chosen the different options, evaluated them, come up with some preferred configurations, um, it's time to revisit the business case, um, look at which of those what options for the configuration of the terminal best meet the business case. And it's important that there is a consensus on those goals. And this comes back to that point about having a core team who are involved through the process, allowing that core team to um, you know, make sure that all the different disciplines are contributing to what are the actual important uh, goals so that the right um, answer is arrived at um, from assessing those options. And the final chapter of 
uh, chapter 4.12 is just once you've made the, the final decisions on how the terminal is going to be arranged, this is basically guidance on taking that through to um, the engineering phase, all of the um, uh, details to consider and getting that ready for going on to engineering, which is um, section six, which we'll be coming to later on. And again, um, we would just emphasize here again, the importance, particularly for an automated terminal of maintaining planning team engagement through the engineering phase. Um, it's, you know, very um, uh, a decision by someone during the project delivery stage of the project who hadn't been aware of why things have been done the way they are, they decide to make a change because it will save money, then that could actually be disastrous for the long term operations and ability to meet the business case. And as we said before, it's not so easy to go back on those kind of decisions with an automated terminal um, compared to a manual. Okay, so that's chapter four. Um, chapter five is around integration. And now this is a um, very specialist uh, subject. I'm not going to go into much detail on this. Again, I'll just run through each of the chapters that are in there. Um, but moving to the next slide, uh, the important thing to note here is stealing these words from Tom Ward. Um, most important steps in automation planning are integration, integration, and integration. It really is the area which is the uh, potentially the biggest difference between um, automated or semi-automated terminals compared to manual terminals. Uh, it's it's uh, you know very um, uh, complex interfaces between each component of the overall system of the automated terminal. It's not enough to just buy those components individually and stick them into place and assume that everything will work. Um, you have to think about exactly how those individual components will work together right from the early stages of planning. And it never stops. The integration element continues um, even beyond the start of operations because things may change, um, components may change, there may be new technology to be introduced. So integration is an ongoing thing. As I said, there's a lot of specialists, it's a specialist role, specialist expertise, but again, it really reinforces the, the importance of having that continuity, having someone have that knowledge of the process from early in the planning all the way through um, getting the integration specialists involved as early as possible so that these things get thought about because it becomes much harder to deal with the problems later on. Um, moving on to the next uh, slide, this just basically gives a bit of an overview of what Chapter 5 is all about. It's just emphasising that integration cuts across all the different parts of the terminal, um, the equipment, the infrastructure on which the equipment is sitting, um, the systems that uh, allows the equipment to talk to each other, as well as how the terminal is operated overall and measures that are in place to support the terminal operations. Um, quickly moving on, so I'm going a bit over time. Um, again, I'm not going to go through all of this, but these slides are just to emphasize for each component, there's a lot to think about. You know, these, there could have been hundreds of bullet points on these slides, just emphasizing um, there are, you know, there's so many different uh, instruments um, and interfaces, all of which have to be integrated. Um, you've got to be inter integrating, considering how the manual operations, which can't yet be automated, how do they integrate with the system of uh, the automated components of the key crane, um, the different operations that the key crane has to do, you know, how is it, how is it carrying out each of those tasks? Um, uh, 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 you know, how does it transition from one task to the next? Similarly, on the next slide, similar questions for the horizontal transport, to get from the key crane to the container yard. Um, again, lots of in uh, instruments. You've got the added challenge here of them moving in space. Um, how do you, uh, how does, how does the, how does the equipment navigate? Um, how does it get to the right place, both at the key crane and at the key, at the, the yard cranes? How does it get there at the right time? You know, how does, how does the equipment know to, um, when it, when it is needed at a particular crane? and so on. So there's a lot of interactions, um, a lot of options, um, all again, all need to be integrated. So can't really emphasize enough how how much thought needs to go into these elements. Uh, chapter 5.5, similar points really for the yard cranes. Um, again, won't go into all the detail of this. This is just to highlight the, the number of things need to be considered. Same for chapter 5.6, which is on dock rail cranes. And there are some particular challenges when you get to there because of the, um, obviously you then in introducing the, the trains themselves and there are elements around the trains that it's harder to get a train to stop in exactly the right position. Um, uh, you have, you know, at the moment, people need to get in there. Um, 
alongside the train. That's something that can't yet be um, removed from the system. So how do how does the the crane safely work around those people? And that's how you know the chapter five goes through each part of the system in turn. Uh, chapter five point seven then looks at the um, automation of management and control systems moving up a, a chain really from uh, the individual sensors and drivers that are on any bit of equipment and then each day talk going up levels between individual bits of equipment all the way up to how the overall terminal operating system works and integration of each of those steps uh, as well as considering external systems you know is there a need to integrate with um, systems that are outside the terminal um, booking systems um, uh, port community systems that sort of thing and finally chapter five concludes with uh, some guidance around how to manage the whole process um, you know determining your strategy in the first place um, developing a roadmap for how you're going to manage it how you're going to engage with um, what are the requirements how you're going to manage the interfaces how does that impact on the manufacturing process and how is the how is the integration being considered with the suppliers of the equipment and the operating systems and it continues all the way through to the final testing and um, uh, the training go live with the terminal uh, and hand over and continues through the ramp up stage and uh, that concludes my part of the presentation um, so thank you for listening i'll hand you over now to Carsten to move on to chapter six thanks tom uh, evening everyone um so one of the underpinning um, differences between automated and manual terminals is the need to separate uh, the people from the automated equipment so that we don't have, because equipment, well, we might call it smart equipment, it's not smart enough to detect that there's people around it, so it will actually not know that you have the people around it. Um, so. Uh, Michael, I'm assuming you're going to be the driver, so can you jump to the next slide for me, please? Um, so in terms of infrastructure and utility requirements, it's there's not big differences between automated and manual terminals, but it comes with that slight twist. If you look at pavement as an example, the trouble we have with automated terminals is that the equipment is too precise uh, in its travel paths. So as it's moving around the terminals, it's uh, you get an increased channelization uh, on your pavement simply because the equipment goes the same route every time unless you build in a uh, an option in the equipment to send it off that track uh, and then keep coming back again and rolling over with an offset. The other thing that's come out of uh, studies of automated terminals is that they actually have higher dynamic forces. So even with the introduction of ramp up and ramp down on drives and motors, you still see higher dynamic forces than people driving equipment does. So that also affects how we uh, end up designing the infrastructure that supports all this equipment. Another important factor is that most uh, terminal owners will want to uh, increase the time between maintenance uh, inside the automated area simply because it is highly disruptive to go into the automated areas because you basically have to shut down the section that you want to work in because you can't have uh, people around automated equipment. Um, there's also often limitations on where you can put your in-ground services um, and particularly pits and how you uh, shape your pavements for stormwater and so on. They're all things that come into place because equipment is not as flexible as people are. Um, the biggest difference probably is in around the data networks and how they all get reticulated across your terminal and how they interface with the positioning system for the mobile equipment. And all that has to be uh, tightly controlled. You wanna make sure no one can hack into that and take control of your equipment, but you also wanna make sure that you know exactly where each piece of equipment is at any one point in time. As mentioned before by Tom Ward, um, 
more and more of this kind of equipment becomes electrified and that then puts pressure on your availability of power and the uh, reticulation distribution of that power within your terminal. So again, it challenges some of the uh, engineering around those aspects that we haven't had before. The biggest thing is the protection of humans from interface with automated equipment. There's uh, double lock systems in place, most uh, terminals to make sure that you don't have this, uh, you know, curtains, there's uh, all kinds of systems that are introduced to make sure that if an un, uh, unknown person enters into this area, they can't do so without being detected that they've entered the area. And once that happens, the whole terminal stops and then all the excitement begins. Um, to enable you to get in and actually do some maintenance within your terminal, they are often divided into smaller segments so that you can take out a small section of the yard at a time if you knowingly want to go in there um, and do some maintenance. Next slide, Michael. Um, when it comes to the construction of these terminals, there's you've got your brownfield and your greenfield, and Tom uh, Tom Ward touched on that that the brownfield is harder than the greenfield. Um, but there's one thing that I bet if you asked any uh, terminal operator two years ago, what is the biggest risk to your business? No one would have on that list a global pandemic. Well, right now, that is right up there at the top of the list um, because you would not believe how hard it is to automate a terminal and get it commissioned if you cannot get the automating, uh, automation engineers onto site. It is painful. So if we go down and have a look at each of the two, I mean, the green field is uh, often a pressure that sits around getting the optimal outcome as quickly as possible. So it's the sequencing of how the work is done. It's making sure that you've got enough area because uh, the equipment, sometimes you buy the raw equipment from uh, one supplier and the uh, equipment control systems come from someone else. And then that's then got to be integrated with your terminal operating systems. You're actually going to need a decent area where you can do all these commissioning of the equipment um, because when you get delivered equipment, you don't get one delivered. Uh, you kind of get all of them delivered at the same time. So it takes up a fair bit of space. Um, and let's be honest, most of these greenfield developments uh, have a tendency to run over time. And then the pressure starts ramping up on getting handover areas so they can start operations, start earning money. Um, not so much in Australia, but in other places, the source and the stability of the site-wide power supply is a big challenge. Um, if you don't have stability, your equipment will keep tripping out. And it's not just a matter of going and turning the power off and turning it back on again, and everything is back up to uh, operation. It takes hours to get a terminal back to operation again. Um, and most importantly, when you're in greenfield, Where's you, the people that are going to maintain this going to come from? And most of the terminal operators that today operates automated terminal will say that they've changed from being a stevedoring business to being an IT business. They consider themselves being an IT business because if their IT doesn't work, their terminal doesn't work. Um, and I'm sure Michael has got the scars to prove that too. Um, when we talk about brownfield, it's more about, as Tom said, you have to take out sections of your uh, operations to actually enable the uh, conversion to automation. And that then also sparks you're probably going to have to change your toss. You're probably going to have to introduce an equipment control system, which you haven't had before. Uh, it just becomes really, really tricky. But also it flows on to where your maintenance facilities are located and how do you get the automated equipment from where it is to the maintenance facility. Um, it often involves the reconfiguration of your road and your rail interchanges um, and the training and development of, of operators and maintenance personnel should not be underestimated. Again, they go from being people that dealt with mechanical uh, problems to being people that are dealing with IT problems, you know, electrical instrumentation problems. 
Uh, next one, Michael. Um, when it comes to your procurement delivery strategies, um, as a terminal developer, you have to be really honest with yourself uh, when it comes to this, because if you don't have a in-house, highly skilled, uh, capable and available team, then you need to go and find someone that can do that for you. Um, if you don't have a clear procurement and delivery strategy from the outset, then you're likely to kind of find yourself in a bit of a pickle along the way. And the risk profile is very different between the various uh, procurement delivery strategies. Um, so you need to work through internally what it is that your business uh, has an appetite for and what they don't have an appetite for, and then pick the one that actually meets your needs. Um, and people that think that I'm buying equipment all the time, uh, how difficult can it be to go and do procurement for an automated uh, terminal development, they'll quickly find out that it is not the same skill set. So the biggest thing here is for these developers and to be really honest with themselves uh, and surround yourself with good people. Um, that's how you generally succeed. So typically in these big uh, terminal uh, automation projects, there's three kind of ways that you do it. You either do a turnkey, you engage someone to do the whole lot and they take care of all the interfaces and all that. You've got to pay for that because they now have to have the big team. Uh, often there's a what we call a base civil and then an operator civil and equipment uh, contract where the base civil is often in a scenario where you have a port authority that'll do the key side structures and the land reclamations and that kind of stuff. And then the operator comes along and does his thing afterwards. And then there's the multiple contract where you just split a project into umpteen different contracts, one for the civil works, one for the pavement, one for the electrical, one for the whatever. And you end up with a large number of contracts and you need a very big team to manage all those. So again, be mindful of your choice. Um, changing it halfway through, virtually impossible. You got to have the right strategy for your delivery up front. I think that's the end of me, Michael. I think it's over to you. Uh, thank you, Carsten. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Michael Howan, and probably what I wanted to deal with today was probably a recap of what everyone else has said, but from an operational context, how truly to deliver one of these projects, an automated terminal or a semi-automated terminal, does involve pursuit of the, grind, the golden triangle. It's people, process, and technology. We've touched on that. We've looked at the different types of technology and how they could be used in a fit-for-purpose, fit-for-use way, how the process design is all important. But at the end of the day, if your people aren't in place and able to use the system uh, as it is intended to use, or the system works in the way that you need it to, to be able to meet your operational task, you end up in problems. And the reality is, out of the history of all the automated terminals in the world, very few could be classed as having no problems and uh, easy ramp ups into production. If we look at it in terms of the growing numbers, it's hard and there's a rapid progression, but we're probably saying 5% of the world's terminals today would be a class as automated. The number is growing. Uh, industry surveys tend to suggest that just about everybody though in the remaining group sees that they need to commence planning for automation within the next five to 10 year window. So it would give you a good indication that the progression of automation is certainly a strong industry trend. But as part of that overall project design, the emphasis on operational planning being embedded, Tom said it right at the start, without an operations team who understands the objectives, having clear business goals and designing that system to meet your operational needs, you're going to run into problems. So that detailed understanding of your operational and your maintenance tasks that Carson just touched on is vital. And that process design really informs the overall system design as well. Everything we touched on, the way equipment works, how they interface, the data that it exchanges, how it runs, how productive it is, comes down to that process design and a process that suits the operational need. So how do you get your staff and, and training people ready for that as well in a you know, potentially unknown environment? So uh, from the traditional terminal, it was based on 
purely manual operation of equipment where people grew uh, and grew to understood their roles by tutoring, mentoring, on-the-site training with the driver, driver training, go out and drive a straddle, go out and drive a crane. I learned how to do it effectively over a period of months or years to be able to bring together a productive workforce. You now have a much compressed timeline in terms of your project timeline to get your people ready. So a significant part of the project uh, planning has to go into that workforce design. Have I got the right number of people with the right number of skills that will be able to meet uh, the new change schedule potentially of higher availability under automation? How do I prepare them with those skills? Do I need simulations? Do I need digital twins? Do I need immersement in other systems? Can I learn from others? And that is one of the challenges that a lot of the terminal designs that we're seeing uh, in some way bespoke. Everybody has done things a little bit differently to suit their environment that they needed. So prior learnings from others and being able to pick up the skills has been a challenge. Customers and external parties as well is different as, uh, approach too. It's a very important part of a project to consider your communications and your relationship with those customers. We talked about ramped up. We talked about impacts on brownfield terminals. How do you get your customers ready to understand that there may be a period of reduced productivity or loss of window time or whatever to allow you to achieve your goals? So is that volume that is shared, it is transferred between your other sites or done whatever, is something you need to prepare for. Uh, Jan Kuppens, who's the head of global engineering for DP World, actually is one of the contributors to this paper and presented at a terminal operators conference several years ago about DP World, one of the world's largest terminal operators, and their experience with introduction of automated equipment. And without fail, the, the pattern he saw was a longer ramp up period towards the expected productivity when compared to any of the manual implementations they'd done previously. It doesn't mean to say that the end productivity is not attainable, but the lesson learned is probably what we've just touched on, that preparing your people and finding a different way of training them and getting them ready is vital. To Tom's point about integration and test and test and test too, if you leave your problems till the implementation, the ramp up, the go live phase, you're going to struggle to meet your operational targets. So the ideal world, and maybe that's a rosy idea view of the world, is that all that integration and testing and verification is done well before you try and throw the system into full production because you face significant risk to your business by not being able to meet your commercial targets. Maintenance staff as well, again, we've dealt with that. These machines are very different. They require a level of precision to work. You can no longer expect your manual driver to drive a machine that is just good enough and use his human plastic brain, the fantastic computer, to work his way around problems. The machines have to be maintained to a very high standard and a very high level. So there is more preactive, uh, proactive, preemptive maintenance done rather than reactive. So the machines don't come into the workshop now when the wheel's just about fallen off. It will start to throw up errors as soon as the steering, steering controller sees a deviation that is outside of a set tolerance and you need to act on it then and there. Or, and as Carsten touched on the difficulties of getting to those machines, cycling them through operations is a new challenge in automation. So the preemptive maintenance to keep them working within tolerance at all times is extremely important. It does lead you into the, the holy grail though. Automation uh, brings in goal at site for all the asset management people online today about truly being able to move to the predictive maintenance model. You now have a set of equipment and a terminal that works with a known intent. Every piece of machinery has a prescribed behavior to it, how it drives from point A to point B, the exact velocity it moves at, the path that it takes, uh, all those things are now under control and there is no variation based on human behavior. And they are connected. You know, everything is connected in the system to make it work. So there is a huge amount of data available and that data is able to be compared, as I said, between what was intended and what actually happened. So where are my deviances? Where is my loss of production? Where are my losses against the targets? And also, what is starting to go wrong with the machines? Where are the, uh, where are the maintenance, the breakdowns, the problems coming from? And using that data requires a digital toolkit to support it. So your maintenance staff have to be prepared to be able to use those systems. The system has to be built that allows them to see, to visualise and to understand their equipment in a way that's never been there before. 
Safety, security and cyber security. Again, we touched on in other sectors of the paper about how those things are involved in the planning, but from the operational perspective, they are extraordinarily important. History of Steve Oring would say these were fairly dangerous operations if you go from the days of you know, lugging cargo up by hook from the hold. The wear on terror and people was enormous. The industry has transformed over years as you know, heavy industrial equipment was brought into play to meet just pure muscle power or to replace pure muscle power. But even those machines had tolls on people. If you look at a straddle carrier, a fairly common horizontal transport vehicle used worldwide, um, traditionally there's been a large amount of problems involved with the workforce in using them. They are high off the ground. The guys have to climb 13, 16 metres to access the cabin. They are noisy. They sit in ergonomic positions that... Uh, are less than ideally ergonomic, I should say, inducing stress on their backs, on their necks, on their hands and on their eyes. Uh, it's also maybe a point to throw in there that, you know, largely around the world there's a trend towards an ageing workforce as well. The ability for people to operate these equipment as cranes get bigger, you need to drive them faster to be productive. Putting people in the cabins of these machines generates more and more stress on people who are potentially less physically able to deal with it as well. So there's a moral responsibility to... You know, make sure our workforce is as safe as is possible, and automation offers that opportunity. Safety, though, is not just a matter of being an afterthought and saying, excellent, I've now got an automated piece of equipment that solves my problems. It is vital that the safety planning, and particularly functional safety, where we see system behaviours now being used to deliver safety outcomes rather than training and behaviours of people, the administrative measures, have to be built and integrated and tested as an embedded part of that planning process. So the V model at the bottom of the safety section there really replicates what was shown in the integration section, that throughout the process, the safety considerations have to be captured from day one as part of a HAZOP process against those initial uh, operational processes that we mapped out. That allows us to understand the roles and actions of people as they interact with this machinery and identify where the new sets of hazards occur. And very much then, you know, category ratings, SIL ratings, performance levels all come into play. So if I want to deliver, if I want to ask an automated system to deliver a safety outcome for my people, how do I prove or how do I ensure that it's got a level of function or reliability that is very important? And that's where standards, using standards from uh, as guidance towards both the life cycle and to be able to categorise uh, the safety level required from systems. Using those as a common platform to work with vendors and deliver those outcomes through testing, integration um, and validation in the end state are extremely important. From a site security point of view, automation offers significant benefits just through the tighter controls that do exist. Uh, you know, throughout the world, all terminals engaged in international trade particularly are required to meet uh, the safety at life at sea regulation outcomes. So in Australia, we have Maritime Transport Security Act, and every terminal has to have a maritime transport security plan. Automation can actually make you to deliver, uh, help you to deliver more secure outcomes for your terminal. There's more monitoring, there's more access control, there's more visibility across what the equipment is doing, and there's less uh, variability in your process that allows people to be involved and potentially uh, subvert the activities for nefarious purposes. And while it's not a direct cousin, the cybersecurity piece is very important as well. And throughout the paper, we encourage terminal operators considering uh, the implementation of automated systems to really engage specialist cybersecurity help as well, because you do open a new avenue uh, and set of threat vectors using operational equipment that is automated. So there's a lot more dependence on your networks, your Wi-Fi, the function of the machines, and history with cyber attacks would tell us that uh, the supply chain is a very prime target due to the high value uh, of the operations and the fact that it is critical infrastructure. Uh, through you know, probably one of the most recent cyber attacks events uh, affecting the port community was Maersk in 2017, one of the world's largest terminal operators where the Petro virus was, uh, got in there as ransomware into the terminal operating systems and the estimates around Lost revenue were approximately $300 million for Maersk alone, uh, and the estimates across the wider supply chain much larger than that. So it is a real risk that your operations that itself may be disabled if your automated equipment is shut down, but also the increasing level of connectivity across the supply chain with your vendors, with your shipping lines, with your landside operators, uh, just 
increase the number of avenues and the number of vectors for cyber attack to occur. So the conclusions to wrap it all up, we're on the home straight for everyone, is that this is no easy task, but it is certainly uh, the port industry and the port sector is not immune from the need to adopt these types of technologies to be able to compete in an ever uh, increasing and demanding supply chain that just requires greater visibility, greater velocity and greater consistency of the operations. Uh, this technology lets you to do it. Uh, let you do it in reducing the chaos that was inherent in a manual operation. The fact that on every given day there was a set of variables that you were unable to manage. It comes down to human behaviour, whether it was weather, whether it's climate, whether there was a football game on Friday night and everyone wanted to go and watch it in the, in the rec room. Automation relieves a lot of that inconsistency and the visibility of the systems and your ability to manage it towards a productive outcome is far greater. Safety, we touched on the outcomes, but one anecdote we'd say even here from Australia was the enormous change since uh, automation start being introduced in the early 2000s in the industry where most of the terminals within Australia had a lost time injury frequency rate closer to 100 than zero. Whereas the levels now amongst the automate, automation, ah, sorry, on the automated terminals are at that ultimate goal of around zero or very close to it. And most of the injuries that are seen now come from environments that we can't control. So getting on board a vessel uh, is an unknown state. It's slippery and we're not in control of that. Uh, proves the point that there's a significant advantage within the automation to it. Certainly more consistent productivity may not be there, may not match it. At the end of the day, these are very similar machines to what are used in a manual terminal. A forklift is a forklift and largely you know, it works the same way. But productivity may come through other avenues is that the uptime of the equipment is far greater. There are left shift changes or change uh, impacts on the machinery through that inconsistency involved. So as a net outcome, productivity can be greater. And that competitive advantage is what everyone is seeking for, being able to do the job at hand uh, more productively, more consistently, uh, and better than the guy next door to me who's driving the wave. It does require a robust business case. There is real risk that we've touched on, but there is also significant benefit. And a huge part of your business plan, the decisions that you make need to be based on that awareness. Risk management is first and foremost in, in your project design. There are lots of different types of equipment that we've touched on, and operators need to select what is fit for their use and fit for their purpose. There is no point implementing a high stacking density model that has got the highest capital cost attached to it in a small terminal where you need flexibility and have space to burn. You are better off looking at a low capital dollar uh, entry point and introducing progressive automation as you build throughout the life cycle of the terminal. The holistic planning is vital. People, process and technology, we've touched on that, but there are multiple aspects of this design question to consider and your project must deal with those in day one. If any one of those pieces is left as an afterthought and wrong that introduces uh, Significant risk. Plan and test a lot. Tom's favourite motto, integrate, integrate, test, test, test. And new technology allows us a real uh, advantage in being able to do that. Tom touched on dynamic simulation, but really today with digital twins and the ability to really replicate and emulate your actual equipment using the PLCs that are in, in place on the machine, the actual code that's going to be used and virtualization of the environment and the sensor input allows you to test in a way that has never been done before and reduces that risk of your know, production impacts on day one. Also a really interesting tool to help prepare your people as well. If digital twins are available, I can train my people on remote control desks driving a virtual crane in a way that I never could before either. And the organisations must be ready before, uh, must be made ready as well. And that's across all sectors of your business. Tom touched on that. It's finance, it's IT. It's an organisational change to get your people ready, but there's a new skill set involved as well. So maybe you are more of an IT company than a you know, manual stevedore, but everything does change. There's a lot more data at your fingertips. There's a lot more ability for continuous improvement in a controlled fashion. Uh, we often joke that you, know, you can choose in a manual terminal to try and do things, but the effort all goes into changing your people and changing your behaviours. In a manual terminal, the, uh, sorry, in an automated terminal, the effort is different. You program a new behaviour and you test it and you switch it on and the terminal operates 
ideally, that way from that point onwards forever. So if you want everything to drive clockwise tomorrow, you change the code and it happens. There's no toolbox talks involved potentially and it's far simpler to do. And your customers and your stakeholders will obviously work in a very different way and they'll, they'll change. The interfaces will change, but ultimately automation brings a significant benefit to all those parties as well in delivering a higher paced uh, and more visible supply chain for us all. So thank you everyone. We'll close it out there and open up to questions. I'll put Andrew back on to facilitate the Q&A process. Thank you. Uh, that was that was excellent. I uh, really appreciate everyone's time. That was, that was brilliant. Um, firstly, is there any questions in the room? And um, Tamika, will you be able to help you out with questions online as, as they come on? Yep, up the back. Uh, the mic will just come around. Yeah, you better come back. Next one. Testing, yep. Just for the people online, the, the question I'll surmise um, is for, for smaller operators, um, are the entry barriers becoming, I guess, less to, to get in, uh, to move to automation? I would absolutely say yes, they are coming down because all forms of equipment that are being used are coming now from the equipment manufacturers with a degree of automation. Typically, the industry saw the capital going into, obviously, the big terminals with high-density stacking from the start. Uh, but there are other solutions, say, that may be more applicable to a smaller terminal. Uh, you are seeing automation of terminal tractors, for one, you know, a straight one. Uh, typical horizontal transport, cheap, low capital cost, ideally electrified, uh, offers significant benefit in a small terminal, and that may be able to interact with a manual forklift or some other form of equipment there. Uh, Tom mentioned you know, RTGs, which, uh, you know, I think in around 2016 were 54% of the world's terminals were RTG terminals or RTG truck trailer. And a vast array of that medium density to small density facilities used it. So, yeah, an RTG can be brought into place, rubber tied, less uh, civil impacts to implement one and the horizontal transport equipment to service it. Uh, can be now introduced as well. I, you know, from experience, the Patrick Terminal in Brisbane here was, I think, the third automated terminal in the world. The project actually started in 1996. Uh, that terminal was a probably 300,000 TU terminal when it started. Uh, plenty of space, so AutoStrad was an applicable solution. Uh, we didn't need to stack too densely. Uh, and as that ma technology matured, was then transitioned to Sydney, which is a million TU terminal. Um, Patrick would still say they operate with a significant degree of competitive advantage against you know, some of the other solutions that are around. Tom or Carsten, do you want to add any more to the to the response? Um, only to say that I guess there's still the entry uh, barrier for a lot of the smaller operators in the cost of capital, because it's so capital intensive to do these uh, developments. But even that is, uh, I guess, being uh, aided with, there's a greater appetite from investors to get involved in these uh, terminals as the technology is more and more proven, and therefore it's not considered a, as high a risk investment for them. So in that sense, it is slowly opening up uh, from a financing and investment perspective as well. Thanks, Carsten. Tom, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I guess maybe one of the other potential barriers would be um, 
the operational um, knowledge inside the organization on, on how to deliver these. Obviously, the larger terminals, if they're linked to larger global terminal operators, um, they have the internal knowledge. So I guess as a smaller operator, the key would be making sure you're you're getting the right advice. Uh, read working group 208 <laughs> from front to back and uh, and yeah, get the right advice to help um, you know, through the whole process. Uh, don't try and go it alone is probably the best advice on that one. Thanks, Tom. Is there any other questions in the room? Yes. <laughs> sure. Sure. Okay. Um, sure. Sure. Yeah. So just just in for the for the folk online. Um, so that so the question was around. Um, I guess what technology technologies exist in terms of uh, automated uh, twist lock, and uh, I guess handling of that to uh, become truly automated. Yeah, you, I understand the background there. That we uh, we know the technology around automated twist lock handling, and it's look, it's actually, in my opinion, you know, one of the one of the real problems that people have still struggled to crack effectively. And I know Rain has done a lot of work, and Laroba is one of the pioneers in delivering that technology. And it is one of the missing links in fully automating the process. That yeah, and look, there's had a lot of success in trials. So I'll agree with it. Yes, um, at the end of the day, if you truly want a fully automated terminal, those tasks around twist lock handling and other potential factors, be they inspections or whatever that are done, there need to be solutions brought into uh, the product mix, the service catalog to deal with them. Uh, automated twist lock handling, you know, is a huge challenge. It is one of the areas where people are still inserted into the process to come in close proximity to moving containers and automation of that process uh, offers obviously a significant degree of improvement around safety and potentially productivity as well. Um, you know, the history of it is that there's, you know, the nature of the equipment itself has proven difficult to solve from an automation point of view and Rain has been working on it, what for now, you know, a long time and we've come an awful long way. So yeah, I think it's absolutely part of the solution and it's, and it's close to the implementation. It does affect the productivity for all those reasons that we've said, because it removes another level of inconsistency from a process that you are trying to manage uh, in a very optimised sense to deliver your overall optimised outcome. Carsten, do you have anything to add to the question? Well, only to say that... Um... The question's got to be asked whether twist locks are the solution, or, because in a in the sense of looking at the whole chain, the automated twist locks on train consists are pretty uh, well known concepts uh, these days, and it seems to be working all right. Um, and the twist locks that we're seeing that still. Um, I guess eludes most people is the twist locks that are used on board the shipping. So there's pressure on shipping lines these days to consider alternatives to having to do twist locks because twist locks also means that you got to get people on board the ship, as Michael was saying before. That means you're getting your people into an unknown territory. Whereas if you could avoid that whole process of having to get people on board, it's a matter of lifting the uh, hatch lids off, then off you go. Um, that's a different concept. So I'm wondering whether this is something where there's going to be, um, I guess, a significant change in the technology uh, applied to this particular problem. Thank you. And uh, Tom, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I guess my, my thoughts on it would be around the, um, uh, the comments I was making in the planning section of the report around the equipment considerations and how um, obviously, it is a, um, a very fast changing technological environment and thinking early during the planning of not just 
what equipment is available now, but how might that be different in future? And think around, you know, maybe when you're selecting ship to store crane solutions, think about if the technology becomes available for automated to slot removal, how how might that happen and how could you try and future proof so that you're ready for that without having to try and change your cranes in future to adapt to it or getting locked out of having that technological option become available. Sounds good. Jonah, if questions online, yeah, we can check. Um, so uh, a question from online. So um, did you have any issues with wireless or radio communication in container yard due to container stacking or is it mostly fibre network and hard wire? Do you want to start first, Michael? Uh, I suppose the simple answer is that the recommendation for all equipment that is able to be cabled would be so. So ship to shore cranes, yard stacking cranes where fibre is available, it's obviously uh, the most proven and reliable option at this point in time you're potentially dealing with remote control equipment you've got a large amount of video that needs to be streamed with low latency uh, you've got a lot of data flowing back and forth from the machine to control it so whilst 5g starts offering that opportunity to do it and people are looking at mesh networks and machine to machine and all that type of stuff fiber is probably the established method um, where there are challenges i would say is probably with your horizontal transport equipment so something that cannot be cabled, but to work with an automated environment normally needs both network connectivity, again, to share its data and receive its instructions, uh, but also in terms of navigational uh, inputs and outputs. There are a variety of navigational methods, solutions that are detailed in the paper, be they from augmented GPS through to magnets, transponders in the ground, uh, set positions to radar systems or whatever, all of them uh, do require some degree of mobile vehicle to work uh, and communicate. So naturally an environment with lots of stacked steel around brings problems. Uh, from the early days of GPS and the channeling effects that was seen from working in proximity to ship to shore cranes or stacks of containers to just canyoning of your Wi-Fi network, uh, when you've got an access point on your forklift and you're driving around the empty yard and you lose the signal, yes, those are all challenges that uh, there are a number of vendors working on different solutions for. Thanks, Michael. Uh, Carsten, would you like to add any points? This is definitely outside my area of expertise, <laughs> but the only comment I'd make is that there's so many technology solutions out there and you wouldn't, you'd would pick the one that is most likely to work for your particular terminal. And as Michael say, whether that be in-ground transponders or whatever, or it can be as simple as designing your network, your wireless network, knowing that you're going to have these blind spots and you just have to work around that. So to me, it, it yes, it's still a challenge and I don't think it's going to go away any day soon, but you can design your way around it. Thank you. And Tom, anything to add? Yeah, I think engagement with um, specialist suppliers and equipment suppliers and, and looking at how you're um, procuring the whole system uh, at a holistic level. Is there opportunities for um, the whole system to be provided by one supplier, including all the navigation systems and, and one, uh, um, uh, IT connectivity? Um, so you can get the you know, more you can get all of that talking together and, and have the interface managed by one organization, the, the easier it probably becomes. Um, it was also interesting in the one of the working group meetings that we had actually over in LA, it was only uh, just under two years ago, I suppose, but uh, there was a lot of debate then, you know, at that time, 5G was only just becoming talked about. And we had a bit of a session of around a table of everyone talking about what 5G might, influence it might have. And I think the overall conclusion was that 5G is probably going to have, at that time, limited, um, roles in um inside container terminals but such a fast moving environment that may well that feeling that everyone had around the table at the time i mean i'm not i certainly not an expert in it to understand uh what the benefits it might have but even in that two-year period um views may have changed significantly and there may be new technologies becoming available all the time and 
Tom, I'd add one other point. You might be a victim of circumstance as well. Uh, the green, brownfield, greenfield discussion we are having before, uh, do you have opportunity to pull apart your terminal and put in fibre and change power networks and things? So, yeah, again, horses for courses, 5G or in fluid mesh, mesh networks may be your solution given your individual circumstances. Okay, um, so the next question, another online question is, is around the supply chain. So, so what would seem the biggest advantage for the economy would be to extend the automation and, and integration and integrate it through the whole supply chain. Um, so out the terminal gate and uh, to the container yards. Any thoughts on this or do you leave this up to the trucking and logistics industry? All right, uh, how many hours have we got for uh, that question? Because, yeah, that's obviously the extension of the idea. So automation is about con gaining control of your operation and optimising it, but it is part of the supply chain network. So the full optimization solution involves interaction, data exchange, and uh, use of that data through advanced analytics um, and learning opportunities to improve the process and whether that is down to optimizing your birth schedule in a global sense in conjunction with the shippers through to managing the way you stack your yard based on data that you have shared with your landside operators your road and your rail operators uh, you know we will see it very shortly where every truck on the road is online and mapped um, and the schedule that the trucking company has worked to is something that can be shared and optimised with the terminal systems as well. You know, the industry has progressed from, on the land side at least, from a first come, first served basis once upon a time. Every truck used to turn up at six o'clock in the morning and just wait in a queue until you got your box. You know, so you had to wait for four hours in the morning and by lunchtime you could turn up and there was no one there through to a managed time slot system where at least now you book a slot in a certain hour and you arrive and you get service within it and you miss it, you might miss out altogether or pay a, a fine or whatever. But the idea around optimis optimization uh, can certainly improve those outcomes where through advanced analytics you can look at how things are changing in real time, where your trucks are, what cargo is needed to go where, what has what priority and optimise both their operations and your operations to deliver the best outcomes. Carsten, would you like to add any points? Well, my, my, the biggest challenge I see for the full supply chain integration is it would require a change in legislation in today's Australia because we limit automation currently to up to the gate. Um, and after that, it's all manual because once the trucks or trains leave the gate, they have to interface with us out on the roads. And at the moment, that is not a permissible uh, exchange. You can't have an automated truck driving in between the rest of us, uh, human beings driving vehicles around. Um, so it's not to say it can't be done, but in today's environment, that is just not possible. Um, you would then start getting into that whole challenge of, uh, and that becomes a moral dilemma, you know, um, what do you do with uh, vehicles once they get automated out in, in the bigger uh, community? Um, so I don't see that full supply chain integration happening in a short term horizon. I see it as being a much longer term horizon, but the inside, the terminal, I guess, terminal to terminal, including the uh, the shipping, uh, I could see that being automated uh, as a full supply chain. But once it gets to the terminal, I think you're going to find it hard. Thanks, Carsten. And Tom, any any other points to add? Yeah, I think I'd add to what Carsten was saying, that obviously the big challenge being the, the autonomous vehicles uh, on the road, which, which I'm sure are coming. Um, I think the technology is you know, pretty close, but it's the society um, that has to adapt to before that becomes um, commonplace. Uh, I think obviously that that also, you know, extends the battleground of uh, the impact of automation and uh, labour, uh, sorry, industrial relations, um, you know, that would expend, extend that argument out beyond the gates of the terminal. 
Um, and I, th- I thought that you know it's probably going to be small steps. Sort of, there are already you know we've been involved in projects where it's already been thought about of potential having um, short distance automated transfers to from a terminal to sort of logistics parks um, close to and in in, in the port and, and around the port. Um, I know that there was a there was actually a, um, but it just showed a challenge of it. There was a study, I think, in um, Rotterdam where they were trying to um, develop a, a large-scale um, pilot for for doing that. And uh, I understand from some someone else on the on the working group that that's who was involved in that study that that's recently been sort of dropped for the time being. Um, so you know, even ports like Rotterdam that are the forefront of automation are finding it difficult even to implement that sort of short distance automated um, transfer, but it is coming and eventually will be here. Thank you. Is there any last questions from the room? Yeah, Russell. Or I? Okay. Um, so let me, let me surmise that, mate. Um, so I guess there's a fairly tried and, and, and proven uh, method for development of greenfield um, manual terminals. Um, the question is around for, the auto, for an automated um, terminal, how much additional time um, in, in terms of schedule do you get to before you actually, you know, in that upfront planning and business case development, before you start engineering all the infrastructure that goes into an automated terminal. Senator Rob? Okay, sorry. Maybe more from a resource effort than just, just schedule. Uh, so I suppose the first response would be uh, the issue we've raised today around the expertise gap and risk. So if you have that awareness as an organisation that you do not necessarily have the expertise and that there is a level of technical complexity that is far greater than, say, a traditional manual implementation, your, your risk-based approach should inject uh, into your project or include in your project the effort to deal with those things. So, you know, depending on lots of variables, the size of the team, your people you have in play, where you have to go to get it, the size of the the project in itself but I agree with you in that sense that it is a significant degree of effort over and above what was traditionally done because my experience has been that most traditional terminal operators had a large degree of experience around their equipment and their mode of operation and if they wanted to expand the terminal or, or buy some new equipment they knew exactly what they were dealing with and they were quite happy to procure let's get another ship to shore crane let's get another 10 straddles and we'll pave this block and away we go. We'll go and put the line marking on it. We'll train the guys. We'll give them the toolbox talks, and we're away. Uh, automation brings, you know, more complexity to that process, and is requires a degree of precision that we touched on far greater. So there's much more effort has to go into the planning around the extension, and then the testing and the integration to make sure that those changes that you've made work effectively, rather than relying on, hey, that's cool. The guys can go out there and drive on it tomorrow, and we know it will work. Well, Carsten, do you want to have a shot at that one too? Yeah, I guess it, in my experience, it would depend on whether you, if you're doing a brownfield development from scratch, then you need to consider uh, the full extent of your development. And the first step is always the hardest because that's the one where you need to put all the big picture thinking into it. Um, and that means mapping out what is this terminal ultimately going to look like? And then you kind of might do phase one in more detail, but you got to do the big picture view first. You start there and then you work your way down to the stages of your development. But yeah, I, I'm with Michael, you know, the, the effort required to um, 
get to a point where you can go and put your hand on your heart to your uh, your business and say, here is the plan for how we're going to automate this facility is substantially bigger than the plan would have been traditionally for a manual terminal um, because the outcomes went on. I guess the difference in operation between a, a straddle operation and a RTG operation isn't that significant. But the difference between a automated and a non-automated operation is quite significant because of all the technology integration you have to uh, you have to solve before you can even get there. So yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. Thanks, Carson. And Tom, is there anything to add from your point? So I know the question was sort of talking about the resourcing level, but if it if you're talking about the time schedule, it's worth drawing attention. There was one of the early slides in Tom Ward's presentation was a very useful figure that's in section one of the working group guidelines, which which does bring together a bit of a summary of the timelines for each stage of the project. And uh, uh, the general consensus is that you're looking at about twice the overall length. You know, it's talking about for a manual terminal what might take 24 to 45 months, taking more like 52 to 84 months before you get to the point at which your business case, your goals are being reached, performance levels being reached. Um, and if it's a semi-automated terminal, maybe somewhere within the middle of that time period. Um, so obviously, you know, it is a, it does take a lot longer to get it to, to where you want it to be. Um, and that's longer at each step of the process. Thank you. Okay, um, there's there's still a few questions online, but we might we might wrap it up there. Um, we'll we'll collect those questions and we'll endeavour to to get a response out to to everyone in the in the group. Um, yeah, look, I'd, I'd I'd really like to to thank everyone uh, for their time this afternoon, um, particularly the the speakers, uh, Tom Ward putting putting the, uh, his video together. Um, uh, Tom uh, Crawford Condy, um, Carsten Varming, and, and and Michael Howen, really appreciate their time, their effort, um, and 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 thanks to everyone for tuning in online and also coming in person here. It's nice to to get back to meeting face to face, uh, although it is a, a room full of masks. Looking back at us, um, it, it it is uh, it it is nice to meet people back uh, face to face. So thank you very much, and um, yeah, talk to everyone soon. Cheers.